All right, well, this is the next to the last class of our CSE 104. We're going to try desperately to finish uh, everything we have on seminar part seven about questions and answers, if my voice holds up for the whole thing here. Uh, one of the questions we get asked, uh, since God made the sun on day four, and it says it was the fourth day, how do you know when the first day was, or the second day, or the third day? And people like Hugh Ross will use this to say, see, the first three days are not the same as the rest of the days. Which means it opens a door for the idea they might have been millions of years. <laughs> it doesn't open the door for any such thing. But how do we have it? Well, in Genesis 1-3, uh, God said, let there be light. In Hebrew, this is the word or. In English, we have one word, light, that really means two things. If I say, turn on the light, okay, the light produces light. Well, this is the source of the light, and this is what it produces bouncing off my hand. So, two different things. Hebrew has two different words, distinguishes more. Or is the um, light, and meor is the source of the light. So God actually produced light before he produced the source for the light. Um, God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. You look at Genesis 1-5, and God called the light, that is or, day, and this was the first day. When you get down to verse 14... God said, let there be lights. Hebrew is meor, which means the light giver. So first he made the light. Apparently, Henry Morris has a great footnote on that, saying God made the electromagnetic spectrum, which includes all. He put everything into motion. Uh, they've now discovered that sound waves can produce light. High-frequency sound can hit water and gives off light. So God, God spoke and everything. I don't understand that. I doubt anybody does, but... Uh, Apparently, there's a strong relationship between sound, God speaking, and the energy in the universe, wow. which goes back to universe. Uni means single, and verse is a spoken sentence. You know, we have verse and prose in English. All the energy has come from. All the energy has come from God speaking. Let there be. Oh, and everything said, okay, yes, sir, Lord. I, I don't understand. I'm sure we're going to get to heaven and say, wow, you know. <laughs> right now, we can just, you know, scratch our head and wonder. But I really suspect we're going to find there's a strong connection between God's voice and everything actually owes itself, its, its very existence, to God's, ver God's word, God's spoken word. So a day, a 24-hour day, is one spin of the earth in relation to anything. Our day starts at midnight. The sun's not even out. So these guys that get all bent out of shape say, oh, you can't have a day without the sun. Well, yes, you can. Okay. If the sun disappeared right now, poof, blew up we'd still have a 24-hour day. Only a few of them, until we all froze, you know. <laughs> okay, but we, we would have, it'd still be a 24-hour day. So these guys are really stretching desperately to try to find some way to stick millions of years into the Bible, and there's absolutely no justification for it. Um, in Genesis 1 feet, 115, God said, let them be for lights, meor, light givers. These are the sources of the light. Okay, the sun, the moon, the stars, etc. To give light upon the earth. And he made the greater light, greater meor, that's the sun, uh, to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. Now some, of course, read this verse and say, oh, the lesser light, that must be the moon. Certainly could be, but I don't know. It doesn't say that, though, does it? All it says is the lesser light. Carl Baugh's book uh, on the panorama of creation is very interesting. He said when God first made the earth, it had this canopy of water or ice surrounding it, and when the sunlight hits one side, this canopy of ice would transmit the light to the other side like fiber optics, and it would light up the other side, just a night light. You know, it's a little terrifying when it's pitch black outside. But when there's a full moon, it's, you know, it's, you can still sleep, but it's just not, you're not quite so terrified okay, when it's a full moon. His theory is that probably God, you know, thought of everything that man needed and made it just perfect. Stronger magnetic field so you could feel which way is north. You would never get disoriented. Couldn't possibly get lost because you're, you know, bees and birds navigate by the magnetic field. Um, and so if, if man could also feel the magnetic field, if it was stronger back in those days, or if we had better iron concentration or something, I don't know, but that's just all something to think about and consider. Uh, so God made the light, and then he made the uh, lights, the uh, sources of the light. Psalm 27 says, The Lord is my light. He actually is the light. Not only the source for the light, he is the light. Uh, God is light, and on Greek, New Testament's in Greek, of course, so it's a different word, uh, folks, where we get our word phosphorescent uh, for light. Um, Psalm 8 says, when I consider the heavens and the stars and all this stuff is uh, God created. So God made the lights, the light, and then he made the sources for the light. 
That would be the difference between or and may or so. Could they have days before the sun? Yes, they certainly could. Here's some observations about light. Since God is light, he can make light without a source. And many ancient cultures worshipped the sun, so I think God made the sun later in the creation purposely so people would not think they're supposed to worship the sun. The sun is not the source of our life on earth. God is the source of our life. Um, and I said life, not light, okay? So God, God's children would know you don't worship the sun. It's a very interesting thing to have, and you ought to keep it up there, but we don't, uh, it's not necessarily the source of our... Uh, uh, we don't have to have the sun to have days. We can have days without the sun. Okay, another interesting story. Mr. Flat and Mrs. Flat. Years ago, a friend of mine from uh, Mississippi uh, was, came to hear me speak at a school I spoke at in Alabama, and he said, Brother Hovind, let's go to McDonald's. I want to show you something interesting. So we went to McDonald's and got some lunch or something. We sat there. He took two pieces of paper, and he wrote on them, uh, Mr. Flat and Mrs. Flat. And he set them on the table at McDonald's. He said, I want you to imagine that uh, we have two flat people. They live in flat land. They are two-dimensional. Put them on the table like this. Mr. Flat and Mrs. Flat. I said, okay. He said, they have no concept of a third dimension. They are simply two-dimensional people. Mr. Flat sees Mrs. Flat, and what he really sees is a, a line. He can walk around and figure out she's actually a rectangle, but he actually only sees one dimension, the length. He perceives two dimensions. Now here we are, three-dimensional people, but you actually only see two dimensions. What you guys are seeing live in this classroom looks exactly like what the people are seeing on the video screen, but what they're seeing on video is two-dimensional. It's on a flat screen on TV. So you only actually see the width and the height, but you perceive the depth. That's why they call it depth perception. Now, If you only have one eye, it's much more difficult to have depth perception. But with two eyes, you get better depth perception like that. You all know how that goes. Okay. He said, okay, Mr. Flat and Mrs. Flat live in flat land. They have no concept of a third dimension. As far as they're concerned, it doesn't exist. So I, as a three-dimensional person, would like to reveal myself to Mr. Flat and Mrs. Flat. Well, there's no way they're going to understand me, because I have more dimensions than they do. But if I stick my finger through the table, Mr. Flat comes over and sees a circle, which is the cross-section of my finger. Over here, I stick three fingers through the table. Mrs. Flat goes and sees three circles. So they're going to meet together and say, oh, honey, I saw Kent Hovind. He's one circle. She's going to say, no, dear, he's three circles. I saw him. And they're going to split the church and start the church of the one circles and the church of the three circles. But neither one fully understands me, do they? They don't have a clue, okay? <laughs> you just can't put a three-dimensional object into two dimensions. You know, you can do it slice at a time. If you drop a ball through a plane, you know, it makes a dot and then a small circle, bigger circle, bigger circle, bigger circle, and then smaller, smaller, smaller dot as it falls through the plane. You just keep slicing it up. But a two-dimensional person can't understand a three-dimensional being. By the same token, God apparently has more dimensions. Um, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18, this is the verse uh, uh, he showed me, it says that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the length and depth and breadth and height. Four dimensions. And to understand the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. Understand something that passes knowledge. That's, I've thought about that till my brain hurts, okay? But we really do understand something that passes knowledge. But apparently there's more to God. See, now, here I, Mr. Flat and Mrs. Flat are living in Flatland. I am outside of their world. I can put my hand right on top of both of them. I can actually be closer to them than they could ever get to each other. And they would be unaware of my presence. And the Bible has all sorts of verses. You know, the Lord is in us and around us and through us and over us and under us. And I don't see him. <laughs> How close is he? Well, he's closer than a brother. Uh, just go home and think about that one. That's the best I can do on that. Let's go to the next question, okay? <laughs> I've thought about it for 10 years since he told me that, and I just I marvel at the thought, you know. Uh, what about the races? Where do we get all these different races? Uh, there's no question there are different varieties of skin colors of people in the world, okay? No question. For 17 years, I drove a bus in an all-black neighborhood, brought black kids to church, and absolutely had a wonderful time. You know, amazing culture. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. But uh, what about these different races? Where do they come from? 
Actually, I'm going to answer this question differently than I would 20 years ago. Uh, there aren't any races. There's one race, the human race. Now, there are different skin colors, but there's only one race. Are these different uh, races of cows? No, there are different skin colors of cows, right? <laughs> okay. There are four different theories about where the races come from, where the skin colors come from. I'll probably use the word races, but you know, ignore that, okay? I mean races. I mean, I mean the skin colors. Four different theories, okay? One theory says all the different skin colors come from Adam and Eve. They were medium brown, and they produced, say, 100 or 200 kids in the first family, whatever they had, you know, 800 years worth, uh, maybe 800 years worth, if it's like my wife and I. But uh, we had uh, three right in a row, so we're going to figure out what's causing this, honey. Uh, one theory says Adam and Eve were medium brown and had all the different skin colors in their own family. Certainly could be, I don't know, okay? The second theory, uh, and by the way, that is possible for, like a black couple here in England had three albino children. Kind of interesting, you know, just different pigmentation. There are people who sometimes will have, you know, a couple where the great-great-great-great-grandmother was black, and you have all white generations after that, and all of a sudden you have a black baby born, or almost black baby. You know, that has happened. Just recessive genes, okay? The second theory, which I do not believe at all, but an amazing number of people do buy into this theory, is that... Uh, this is the mark of Cain. And they think the black race is cursed with the mark of Cain. I think this is a wicked, vile theory, but so many people do believe this. I will show it to you. And Genesis 4.15. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. They will say, the Negroes have the mark of Cain, and therefore they're cursed. Uh, here's a Mormon doctrine from Bruce McConkie, an apostle in the Mormon church. This is what the Mormons have taught for a, for, for a long time, for over a century. They're changing now when they found out the Negroes could play basketball for Brigham Young University. Uh, <laughs> until that time, the Negroes were excluded from Mormonism. Look what they said here. Negroes in this life are denied the priesthood. Under no circumstances can they hold this delegation of authority from the Almighty. This is from the book of Abra 1, 20-27. The gospel message of salvation is not carried affirmatively, affirmative, affirmatively to them. Negroes are not equal with other races, where the reception of certain spiritual blessings are concerned, particularly the priesthood and the temple blessings that flow therefrom. But this inequality is not of man's origin, it is the Lord's doing. It is based and he is based at, and his eternal laws of justice. I should be on. I can know for me to fix that typo there. Based on his eternal laws of justice and grows out of the lack of spiritual valiance of those concerned in their first estate. Now look at that last sentence. This is based on the lack of spiritual valiance in their first estate. The Mormons teach Adam went to heaven and became the god of this world. And there are many gods. And if you're a good Mormon, you get to go to heaven and be god of your own world. They teach that Adam has thousands of wives, he lives on the planet Kolob, he has normal sexual relations with those wives and produces spirit babies. If the spirit baby is valiant in heaven, he comes down to earth and gets a white-skinned body. If he's not valiant or he's not good in heaven, he comes down and gets a black-skinned body. We had two Mormons come to our door over when we lived over on Burgess Road, and two Mormon uh, uh, missionaries, you know. I can tell you a long story about that. I have so much fun when those guys, when those guys show up. But uh, <laughs> this is what they're talking about here. Bruce McConkie. Um, the black people, they say, have black skin because when they were in heaven as a spirit baby, waiting for their body on earth, they were not valiant. And so that's why they got a black skin body. You can see it right here from their teaching. Um, he said, however, in a broad general sense, caste systems have their root and origin in the gospel itself. And when they operate according to the divine decree, the resultant restrictions and segregation are right and proper and have the approval of the Lord. To illustrate, Cain, Ham, and the whole Negro race have been cursed with black skin, the mark of Cain. So they can be identified as a caste apart, a people with whom the other descendants of Adam should not intermarry. Yes, sir. I just wanted to interject. If the Mormons accept Genesis, do they also accept Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy? Oh, yeah, they would say they accept the whole thing. And then Exodus and Leviticus uh, states that the curse of the Lord only goes to the third and fourth generation. Oh, good point. Curse to the third generation. That's a good no, point. I'm sure there's been more than four generations. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'll have to ask them that next time. 
Look at this. Uh, Apostle Mark Peterson said in Race Problems as They Affect the Church on page 7, If there is one drop of Negro blood in my children as I have read to you, they receive the curse. Here's Brigham Young, one of the head, heads of the Mormon church years ago. He said, Shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If the white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, he's assuming that Cain is black. You understand the assumption here? The penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so. And if you want to read the history of the Mormon church, one of the books that I show on video number one at the very beginning of four books that are good to reach Mormons, one is the hidden history of the Mormons uh, and how they, they actually executed people, many people, if they weren't uh, faithful or did something wrong, you know, or if they married or had sex with a black woman, they would be executed. Now, of course, everybody wasn't, but that's what, uh, that's what the law said according to Mormon law. Now, they're kind of embarrassed about this now, and they try to hide this, but that's what it was. So I don't think the curse of Cain is anything close to Scripture. One problem with the saying that Cain became the first black man, an obvious problem with that, when you get to Noah, you're back to one family. So you have a genetic bottleneck here, which would stop all this. Since Cain was before the flood, Noah was after the flood. The only way that could be gotten around is if one of Noah's sons had married one of these black women and brought her on board the ship. Okay, that certainly is a possibility, as, as I don't think the theory is true at all, but those who justify the theory will say that may be what happened. The third theory says Noah put a curse on Canaan. Now, don't get Cain and Canaan confused, okay? Canaan was Noah's grandson through Ham. He had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Here's the story, Genesis chapter 9. Noah awoke from his wine. By the way, let me stop right there and say, I think Noah got drunk accidentally. I doubt fermentation was possible before the flood. I don't know if, Eric, if you ever get asked that question about, you know, did they have alcohol before the flood? But I, I doubt it. I think the theory goes that a canopy of water would increase air pressure, filter out radiation, and prevent fermentation. Probably Noah was used to making his grape juice and setting it on the counter, and it wouldn't spoil. And he can go back and get it in three years, and it's, you know, it's still fine. I mean, I don't know. But... Uh, a few bugs, yeah, strain those out, no problem. That's why I have teeth, you know. Like uh, but uh, I think Noah made the vineyard after the flood and was probably surprised by the, it turning alcoholic. Now, I may be wrong on that, but I'd rather give Noah the benefit of the doubt. And when I get to heaven, I'll say, well, Noah, you know, I guess you really did get drunk, didn't you? <laughs> rather than say, oh, no, I'm sorry I preached the wrong thing about you all those years. You know? I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. I think he did a great job. And, you know, he was a preacher of righteousness. And, um, but here, Noah woke from his wine, Genesis 9, 24, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brethren. Now keep in mind, this is Noah's son Ham, who saw Noah drunk in the tent and naked, and they walked in with, you know, he, he went in and came out and laughed to his brothers. His brothers had more sense, put a blanket over their shoulders, walked in backwards, dropped it over their dad till he woke up. Noah awoke from his wine and found out what Ham had done and said, Cursed be Canaan. Now, I still don't understand that. Ham's the one who did it. But the curse goes to Canaan. You figure it out. But the curse is, A servant of servants shall he be to his brethren. And some people have said, See, the Cain, sons of Canaan are supposed to be servants. Therefore, it's good to make slaves out of the black people. That's the verse they use. right? <laughs> okay, He's supposed to be a servant. I mean, go back and study the pre-Civil War days and read some of the even sermons preached in churches. pastor would get up and say, oh yeah, the black people are supposed to be servants. And they would use this verse of all the dumb things to do. Look at the next verse. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Here we are told again that Canaan's going to be a servant. And people have used all sorts of crazy things to justify this. They'll, they'll take a, the percent... Okay, America is, say, 13% black people in America. I believe that's a percentage. Different states have vastly different amounts. Mississippi is 33%. Alaska is one half percent. They just don't like the cold as much. Um, so they will say, well, you know, 13% of the population is black, and yet if you survey all of the, you know, f fast food restaurants and all, you know, who is in a servant's position waiting on you, you know, uh, and they'll say, a much higher percentage of Negroes are in servants' position as opposed to in leadership positions, you know, managers or whatever, you know. And it's amazing the stuff that's been done to justify this theory. 
to say, oh yeah, you see, he's supposed to be a servant. The fourth theory, and I think the only reasonable one, but none, the Bible doesn't tell us clearly, so I'm not going to be dogmatic on this topic. It may be a mixture of all four theories, okay? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think the Tower of Babel is what caused the, the skin colors. The people were told right after the flood, okay, spread out, have lots of kids, take over the world. Okay, replenish the earth. Uh, Nimrod said, we're not going to do that. We're staying right here. I'm going to be boss, and we're going to uh, build a tower to heaven. Now, there's many theories about this Tower of Babel. Some people say, obviously, they knew they couldn't build a tower to heaven. Others say, oh, no, they calculated what's the maximum height the water can get, and they built the tower to be above that maximum height, and uh, so just so some people could escape if there was another flood. Because the flood was still in their memory. You know, Shem is probably still around when they're building this tower. Probably Noah is still around, preaching to them, hey, you guys were wrong, don't do this. Other people think they built the tower in spite of heaven's command. It says when they built a tower to heaven, it's uh, a, a, a spiteful act. Hey, God, we know you want us to spread out, but we're staying here. I don't know for sure exactly what the truth is on that one. If you find out, let me know. But um, bottom line is they stayed. And God said, that's it. I'm busting this thing up. And he came down and confused the languages. And when you read through Genesis chapter 10, God confused the languages, and they spread out around the world speaking their different languages. Here's the story, Genesis 10:5. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Apparently, it's more than just the languages being divided here. It's also the nationalities. So I suspect that the nationalities, the, even the skin colors, are a result of this Tower of Babel incident. Because if a small group of people go off all speaking French and everybody else all goes off speaking German and Italian or whatever, and end up having to marry back to the same family, in the post-flood era, after the flood, this would be a little more dangerous because now the radiation coming through with no canopy of water to protect them. So probably genetic defects would come in, or they would not have come in before the flood. It wasn't but a few hundred years later, when Moses was here, that God gave the command, you don't marry sisters anymore. Before that, it was common, married sisters. Yeah, royalty, I mean, you look at the old Egyptian uh, royalty, they all married sisters. It was just assumed, you know. You're growing up, you're going to marry your sister. Um, but it became against the law, against God's law in Leviticus 18, uh, which would have been 2,500 years after the flood. So apparently God divided the, the tongues, the families, and the nations. Close inbreeding uh, today causes what we call a redneck. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you marry your cousin a few generations in a row, they start to look pretty strange after a while, you know. Uh, that's, that's what happened with the Habsburg family. For years, the royal line in England or in Europe, you know, all these European families, you had to marry royalty. Well, sometimes the only one available is your first cousin or your niece or your sister. Even Darwin believed in inbreeding. He married his first cousin because he wanted to produce a superior stock. He had ten children. Most of them died early or were retards. Something seriously wrong with them. Okay, it didn't work. <laughs> Darwin. Uh, but the Habsburg family started to look real strange after a few generations of marrying you know, your cousin every time or your niece or your sister. They started to have a real distinctive look about them. <laughs> real long curved nose, you know, and a long pointed face. And those were known as the Habsburgs. Um, Genesis 10.32. These are the families of the sons of Noah after the generations in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So Genesis 10, I think, is pretty clear that the nations came from this Tower of Babel as well as the languages. Now later in chapter 11, verse 1, it says, The whole earth was of one language. And Farrell Till, the uh, former preacher turned atheist that I debated, said, See, there's a contradiction in the Bible. Chapter 10 says we have the languages, and now chapter 11 says we have one language. Well, this is going back and retelling the story. It's not a contradiction at all, okay? It's like, you know, like, like we mentioned that last week. Wasn't it about the headlines in the newspaper, you know, bus crash kills 40 people. And then you read the story and it says, the bus was traveling down, you know, Main Street. You say, wait a minute, I thought the bus crash killed 40 people. Well, yeah, they're retelling the story. Uh, duh, okay? <laughs> and chapter 11 is retelling the story in more detail of what happened in chapter 10. Okay, there's a great book about what happened after the flood, if you want to get the uh, book by Bill Cooper, just a tremendous book on tracing the genealogies of all these people. Where did Noah's sons go and their grandkids and great-grandkids? A very excellent book, if you like that type of research. 
on the genealogies. You can get that from our ministry. Okay, I went through chapter 10 and tried diligently to count how many grandsons Noah had. I found it surprisingly hard to figure out who's a grandson and who's a great-grandson who's a great-great-grandson. Here's my best guess. Japheth, remember Noah had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Japheth had about 14 kids and grandkids. Ham had 31 kids and grandkids. Now one of those 31 is Canaan. So if the curse is on Canaan to become black, which I do not believe, then all of the sons of Ham would not be black necessarily. Right? He's got a lot of other sons in there. And if you read the Bible, in Psalm 105, it says, Israel came, also came into Egypt, and Jacob journeyed in the land of Ham. This is one of those things in the Scripture where they often say the same thing twice in a different way to make sure you can't goof it up. Israel, for instance, is the same guy as Jacob. God changed his name. So this is telling the same sentence twice. This is a Hebrew, uh, I forget what they call it, some way of mentioning the same truth twice. So Egypt is the land of Ham. The Bible's pretty clear about that. And uh, verse 27, They showed his signs among them and wonders in the land of Ham. Psalm 106, They forget God, their salvation, which had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham. The Bible tells us that the land of Ham is... Uh, Africa. And I don't think there's much question in most Bible scholars' mind that the Hamites are the black people. So Noah's three sons apparently are the origin of the three uh, major divisions of skin colors. The black people, the oriental people, and the white people. All came from Noah. There's no reason to be a racist and think one is superior to the rest. Okay, Just there's a distinction here. Japheth is the father of the Europeans. According to most Bible scholars, they'll say, oh yeah, the sons of Japheth went and settled up in, toward Europe. This would be you know, Italy, Germany, uh, Greece, the white-skinned people. Ham became the father of all the Africans. And if you look right there in Israel, uh, or even in Turkey where Noah's Ark landed, that's kind of the point where those three continents come together. Asia, which would be you know, China, Japan, all that on the far right, Europe on the far left, and Africa going south. Now, there's a couple of theories about living near the equator does not cause you to have black skin. Okay, it might give you a good suntan, but your kids don't inherit that. Any more than if you cut your arm off, your kids will inherit you know, that trait. Black people do have more melanin in their skin, and therefore they are more tolerant of the sun. Whereas light-skinned people like me get sunburned easily. You know, when I was down in Costa Rica, eight degrees away from the equator, it's, you get sunburned real quick. Okay? Darker-skinned people can tolerate more sun. Lighter-skinned people cannot. So the equator doesn't cause you to have dark skin. Dark skin causes you to be able to live near the equator. That would be the difference. So it's just a matter of, you know, real estate is more available. And that's why the population of Alaska is only one-half percent uh, black. They just don't like the cold. They don't want to live up there. <laughs> If you send a bunch of them up, a lot of half of them will move back down. They don't want to be up there. Um, and of course, there are always exceptions to the rule. But all you got to do is look at the population statistics of different uh, areas. The colder it is, the less black people there are. It's just, and the, and the hotter it is in some of the equatorial climates, the more black people there are, as far as naturally living there. Like Congo, you know, black people right on the equator. Um, Shem had about 29 kids and grandkids which makes a total of about 75. By my very rough estimate, I would guess there were 75 original languages at the Tower of Babel. Those languages have gotten even further divided now into many, many uh, dialects. Jan, you teach English as a second language. I don't know if you've ever studied how many languages there are in the world, but I think it's well over 2,000. Yeah. Yeah, 6,000 6, counting dialects? That's what we're to say. Yeah, okay. Wycliffe? Well, I suspect English, German, and Danish probably all had a common root. Of course, English is a conglomerate of many different languages. Okay, there's all kinds of French words in English and Latin words in English, but in general, English and German and Danish probably had um, common root. If you look at some of the words like cat, cats, and cat, you know, uh, probably 
Old English, of course, is unreadable to me today anyway. They had, uh, like the old Beowulf story, very difficult to read. Can anybody read any of that? A. You see an A up there, okay. <laughs> and even the A looks a little different, doesn't have the crossbar, right? Uh -huh. This is from 1,500 years ago, 588 A.D., when the Beowulf story was written. Um, modern English, of course, has changed. Even English language today, if it weren't for the fact that we had rapid, rapid communication across the ocean, English language would change uh, into many different dialects. When we were in Australia, you know, I was at the restaurant, and I said to the waitress, would you please get me a napkin? The preacher said, don't ask for it. I said, what? He said, don't ask for a napkin over here. I said, what do I want? He said, you want a serviette? I said, oh, what's a napkin? He said, that's a diaper. Oh. <laughs> so here I am asking the waitress for a diaper. Well, I didn't know. <laughs> I wanted a napkin. <laughs> yeah, lady walked up to my wife. She's lady's going to play the piano. She's got this two-year-old kid with her. And there's a small church, you know, over there. And uh, she walks up, Mrs. Hovind, would you please nurse my baby? The preacher's wife said, it just means hold it. Oh, okay, I'll hold it for you. <laughs> oh, it's just, they, you know, different words. When we had Dave work with us in uh, uh, Texas, he was a brick bricklayer. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> oh, Dave from England, you know. Uh, just some of the things he would say. It just, you know, he put the petrol in the lorry, you know. I opened the boot. The what? The boot, the boot. The what? No, not on your foot. The boot on the car. The back of the car is the boot, you know, the trunk. The boot and the bonnet, you know. <laughs> That's the hood, the bonnet's the hood. This, even today, if it weren't for the rapid communication between these different countries, it wouldn't be long and you wouldn't understand anybody from Australia or England. You know, it'd be a t totally different language. Uh, and there's a lot of words that are different now, but we can, you know, communicate back and forth. Even people from Maine and Boston and Texas and Louisiana, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of different dialects right here in this country, folks, and it's, it's really interesting as I travel around to, to see them. I don't know if you guys remember in Texas, the couple we had, the guy was from Maine and his wife was from Alabama. And she was country all the way and he was one of <laughs> strong Maine accents, you know. It was so funny listening to those two talk to each other. <laughs> you know, you go to Harvard and you park the car in the yard. Anyway, okay, that's the end of the story. But uh, <coughs> probably, <coughs> excuse me, probably Spanish, Italian, French, and Latin had a common root. I wouldn't argue about that. Today we have, say, two to 6,000 languages and dialects, and uh, they probably came from 70 or 80 originals. Acts chapter 17 tells us, though, that all nations are of one blood. I don't think there's any question from Scripture. There's no reason to be a racist. Now, Ken Ham has a great book on that topic called One Blood. Uh, some other people have written that. Malachi says, Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Do we not? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother? There's no reason to be a racist. They now have done a study here about mitochondrial Eve. These guys said back in 1998, I'm sorry, 1988, they said, we've discovered after study, looking at the mitochondria that all the people in the world came from one woman 200,000 years ago. Then they did a study again in 2001 and found out, no, this woman was only 6,000 years ago. They said, well, we know that's not right, so let's go back and study this one more time. So they're, they're still working on it, okay? <laughs> Well, not only did they accidentally hit it right, I could even tell them her name. Okay. And her husband's name and a couple of the kids' names. Okay. <laughs> so I get to Ken Ham's book if you want more on the races. Okay, what about cloning? Let me explain what cloning is, and then we'll tell you, people get really bent out of shape over this, and I don't think it's necessary that they get bent out of shape too much. Um, cloning is where they, normally you have uh, half of the cell comes from the mother and half from the father, and so you get half the chromosomes from each one. Animals that reproduce uh, just simply by dividing, like an amoeba, you know, the amoeba just all of a sudden it just breaks in half and you have two amoebas that are identical to each other, okay? And they will divide again and get three or four or six or ten or a thousand or a billion. But they're all identical. There's no new genetic information being added. Um, with, uh, this is called uh, asexual reproduction, they just simply divide and the chromosomes are identical. In sexual reproduction, you get half the information from the mother and half from the father, and so there's a combination and you get a, a, a new variety of chromosomes, you get a new combination. But what they tried to do is they said, you know, what if we took a cell from a, a sheep, which is what they ended up using, take out the nucleus where the chromosomes are, take a nucleus from another cell, 
and stick it in that cell and then implant it into the surrogate mother and have it grow. Yeah, that was a good idea, they thought. So they worked on it, probably a government grant, you know, like everything else. They didn't actually, they didn't, they sure didn't create the chromosomes, okay? They just simply moved them to a different cell. It would be like if we could figure out a way to get the information off of the hard drive of this computer without using, you know, the standard ways that we use, either a, a cable or a uh, floppy disk or, you know, uh, some, some disk or something. If we could transplant this hard drive into something else, that'd be, you know, wow, look how, look how they moved that information. That was neat. That's all they did. They moved the information from one cell to another. They didn't create a thing. Uh, average human has 50 trillion cells. It would fit into two tablespoons. This DNA is unbelievably complex. Here's one unwound and then unwound and then unwound again. You figure one chromosome, if you stretched it out, untangled all this stuff, it would be about six to seven feet long, over two meters. And you have 50 trillion cells in your body, each one with 46 of those chromosomes, each one six or seven feet long. And we said, oh, if you took the chromosomes and tied them end to end, one person's chromosomes would reach from Earth to the moon and back five million times, coming out of two tablespoons. Someone calculated, if you took one DNA from every person in the world, all six trillion people today, take one DNA strand, one chromosome, which is enough to have the information to make the whole person, and put all of those together, one chromosome from all six billion people would fit in one aspirin. So all that information in one aspirin could reproduce all the people in the world today. All six billion of them. Pretty amazing. Computer code in the chromosomes is more complex than all computer programs written by my, man combined. So they took this incredible code and transplanted it. That's really all they did. Dolly, the sheep, the first one that we know of that was cloned, there may have been more before that they didn't say, you know. Dolly was cloned at a cost of $50,000 after 277 failures. I told them, and the sheep can do this much quicker and cheaper. Okay. All they did was transplant the nucleus into a different cell, implanted it into the sheep, and sure enough, it was born with identical chromosomes to the parents. The problem is, Dolly is aging faster than normal. Because chromosomes, these real long strands of chromosomes, like hairs, they kind of split at the end. And they get split ends and you start to lose data off the ends. And pretty soon, instead of being six feet long, it's only, you know, five foot nine, and then five foot six, and then five foot four, and, you know, you're losing information off the ends of the chromosomes. They, they uh, I think the word is hydrolyze, I'm not sure if that's correct. But after Dolly, if they took a cell from a four-year-old sheep, transplanted it, when Dolly's born, I mean, within a couple years, two years, she looks like she's six years old, aging faster than normal. So they didn't gain anything. Some people say, do you think um, if a human is cloned, it'll have a soul? I'm sure you get asked this question in a Q&A sometime. I say, well, yeah, I don't think there's a problem there. If a woman takes fertility drugs and ends up having quintuplets, and she was only, normally would have one, but now she had five, do they all have a soul? Well, yeah. Should they have been born? Probably not, you know, but they were. Timothy, in the Bible, was his father was a Greek, his mother was Jew. They weren't supposed to marry. They did. Timothy's born. Did God use him? Well, yeah. Great man. Um, Ray, Ruth, the Moabitess. Well, the whole nation of Moab never should have been born. And then you get Ruth marrying into the Jewish line, and she's one of the great, 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 great grandmothers of Jesus. Yeah, God can still use people, okay? I don't think we get... Some Christians are all bent out of shape that if a person is cloned, they won't have a soul and all this kind of... I don't think that's true. I don't, I would, I'm not worried about it. I am a little worried that we might create something that, um, you know, with genetic engineering, it's possible to create something for which there is a disease for which there is no cure. You know, like when the people from Europe came to America, many Indian tribes died off from diseases because they, they, they had, no, had no immunity to those diseases wiped out whole tribes. So we may end up with genetic engineering, make something that'll, you know, get out of hand, get away from us. Anyway, two of every sort, God said, basic kinds of animals. Okay. Um, next question um, we'll take up right after the break. So let's uh, 
take a few minute break and we'll uh, continue. All right, let's continue with a few more uh, questions, try to get as far as we can here. If God made a perfect world, why would there be poisonous snakes? Fair question. People have asked me, said, see, this is proof that, uh, you know, God did not make a perfect world because there are poisonous snakes and, you know, spiders that bite, and obviously God made a mistake. And this is supposed to, in their mind, it's supposed to be proof of evolution. First, I'd like to point out that finding uh, problems in today's world is a far cry from proving the original creation was imperfect. I mean, that's like finding an old car in a junkyard saying, see, these guys don't know how to build cars. <laughs> Hello, it's already got 300,000 miles on it, you know. Uh, we are a copy off 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 a copy of Adam. It's amazing we can even walk. <laughs> right? <laughs> when you think about how this copying process has gone on for so many times, I think it's pretty amazing. So, but let's talk about poisonous snakes. There are a couple of theories about this. I don't have an answer. I'm going to give you the theories. Okay. Um, Carl Baugh did some interesting research on poisonous snakes and found out that uh, under hyperbaric conditions, the poison that they inject is no longer poisonous. For some time, it's been known that uh, poisonous snakes, if you get bit by one, or poisonous spiders, an electric shock will neutralize it. I just had supper tonight with a couple of folks from uh, Texas, right near the Oklahoma border, and they live in a dry area north of Dallas. And one of them said that his son-in-law, I believe, was bitten by a black widow spider. And a week later, the arm was real sore and almost becoming immobile, you know, from this black widow spider. It had been a week. So they saw my tape, this part here, where we talk about how electric shock will neutralize the poison. And so they went and got a stun gun. And, but, of course, the probes are this far apart. So they took it apart and lengthened the probes and attached him to a little plate, put one on each side of his arm, and shocked it with this stun gun. So the shock went all the way through the tissue where this poison was, apparently. And uh, next day, perfectly fine. He'd suffered for a week. I mean, normally, in the mission field, this uh, book, uh, The Jar's Zapper, the couple that came here to visit last week to try Dinosaur Adventure Land from the mission field, uh, one of the sons works at Jar's. They make these things these stun guns, just for use in the mission field. If you get bit by any poisonous snake or spider, they will take a high voltage shock right to the injury site. And if you get it within uh, 30 minutes, the pain is gone within 15 minutes. There was one lady in Texas, her son, little baby, uh, two, one, or two, one and a half years old, I think, got bit by a brown recluse spider. Now the brown recluse spider is incredibly poisonous, especially to a child. You know, the spider is going to inject a certain amount of poison. Well, if you have 200 pounds of body mass to absorb it, it's not quite the same as if you have 30 pounds of body mass to absorb it. Okay, it's just not quite going to, it's not going to bother you as much, as much as it would a child, okay? So, this mother, uh, the kid got bit on the thigh, so they took the stun gun, uh, high voltage stun gun, two flashlight batteries, real high voltage, real low amperage, shocked the injury site. Zap! Within six minutes, the kid was back out playing. Forgot all about the pain. It's gone. But it, it had swollen up already. They said it was a huge welt about this big and real hard, hard like a brick, you know, from this brown recluse spider. Uh, the general rule of thumb is if you get bit by a poisonous snake, if the quicker you can get to a shock, uh, the, the, the better. If you can take a spark plug wire off a lawnmower or chainsaw or engine or something. Now, the older cars, the coil puts out about eight to 12,000 volts. The newer cars might put out 40,000. So you may get more of a shock than you want. <laughs> uh, it beats dying, though, okay? So you may want to just go ahead and get the heft. Okay, crank it over. Oh, I stopped. Stop. <laughs> because it's got a short, 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 short in it, like Ernest P. Whirl. Uh, they say if it's, if it's been a while since you were bitten, more than 20 or 30 minutes, Shock the spot, then go halfway to the heart and shock that spot. And go on the opposite side of the limb and shock that spot. Too much voltage is, uh, uh, too many times it would not be as bad as too few times, okay? <laughs> but just a high voltage shock seems to, seems to stop the problem. Apparently, from what I've read about it, the poison that the snake injects, and there are two different types of poison. Hematoxic, which affects your blood system. 
neurotoxic affects your nervous system. Uh, if a rattlesnake bites you on the arm or leg, if you don't do anything about it, it will begin to, it'll begin to dissolve the tissue. Your muscle will actually rot out. You have a big hole in your body where it will rot it out. And of course, infection and other things become a problem. So, but I've talked to many people, probably a dozen people who've used this and it works with uh, a shock, high voltage shock. Missionaries are using it. Seems to work good. It works for both kinds of poison. Apparently, the poison that the insect or snake injects is uh, it's a protein, but it's a tangled up molecule that the body don't, doesn't know what to do with, so it treats it as an invader. But the electric shock straightens it out. Somebody told me that was here last week, uh, the missionaries, said they even use uh, real low voltage shocks for mosquito bites. No way. They said you get just a real low voltage shock, you get a mosquito bite, zap. Totally stops it instantly. Can't feel a thing. No way. Yeah. You go out there and get bit and I'll shock you. Okay. okay. <laughs> Let's practice, Eric. <laughs> All right. What about the Ark of the Covenant? There are two different arcs in the Bible. Actually, three different arcs. There's Noah's Ark, the big one. Okay. There's the Ark of Bulrushes that uh, Moses was in. Okay. The little basket daubed with pitch that put baby Moses in. And then there's the Ark of the Covenant. That was a gold box, about the size of this table, actually, uh, with a rim around the top. The lid would come off. The lid is called the mercy seat. Inside uh, the Ark of the Covenant, they, the Hebrews kept their sacred things. In there was the table, of, I mean, the uh, Ten Commandments, the bowl of manna. Remember that they saved one bowl of manna when God gave them extra. And they saved the walking stick of Aaron. Because everybody said, I want to be priest, and, you know, Moses said, okay, everybody bring me your stick, carve your name on there. Aaron carved his name on all the rest of them carved their name. And they put them out before the Lord, and the next day, Aaron's had grown. It had budded leaves, almonds on it, you know, and all that, so they, apparently they saved it in this ark for a while. Um, those were the only three things in the ark. Well, so what happened to the ark? Well, here's the story. In Jeremiah, it tells us about the things that they took away out of Israel. Remember, Jer uh, Jeremiah was a prophet in Israel, and God told him to go tell the king to surrender. You're going to lose Nebuchadnezzar. I sent Nebuchadnezzar to take you guys captive. Don't fight him. Voluntarily go into captivity. So they did. Not, they did not obey the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar came and took these guys away captive. He, beat, you know, he said, I want you to surrender, and they didn't surrender, so he beat them all up and killed large numbers of them. And it took them away. It mentions all the stuff they took away here. They took away the spoons, the cups, the candlesticks. It never mentions the ark. You would think the most valuable piece of furniture they had would be mentioned. It didn't mention it. Nebuchadnezzar brought these things out of, out of uh, Jerusalem. And now in Ezra chapter 1, Cyrus the king is going to send them back. So it mentions all sorts of things that Cyrus sent back in Ezra chapter 1. 29 knives. I mean, if it's going to mention 29 knives, surely it would mention the Ark of the Covenant. It doesn't. No place in either passage is the uh, Ark of the Covenant mentioned. Here's the story that uh, Ron Wyatt told me before he died. I sat in his living room and talked to him for three hours about the Ark of the Covenant. He said, Brother Hovind, I, I, I found the Ark of the Covenant. I said, yeah, right. Okay, and I'm Methuselah. I'm still around. <laughs> he said, no, Brother Hovind, I really did. I said, well, tell me about it, Ron. Now, Ron was a great guy. He was the kind of guy that if I was God, I would let him find all these things because he wasn't out for any glory. He's not bragging about it. He wasn't, you know, not looking for money. Just he wanted to, hum he's a humble servant of the Lord. He had a lot of uh, Seventh-day Adventist teaching in him, which I would disagree with, uh, some of the things they teach. He wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist, but he believed some of the things they believe. Okay. Um, he said, I was walking along the north side of Jerusalem and with an a Israeli friend of mine, and we're walking along, uh, talking about things, and you know what happened here, what happened here. Because Ron's been a student of Scripture for many, many years. Okay? He knew it extremely well. He said, we're walking along. All of a sudden, my left arm stuck out, and I pointed to this, this garbage dump. <clears throat> it was a pile of rubble, been there for hundreds of years, you know up against the side of this cliff. And there's a road along the bottom. There's a big cliff and you know, another plateau on top. He said, my left arm stuck out and my mouth started speaking. And my mouth said, 
That's Jeremiah's grotto. The Ark of the Covenant's down there. And his friend that was with him said, what did you say? He said, I think I just said, that's Jeremiah's grotto and the Ark of the Covenant's down there. The guy said, well, great, let's dig it out. He said, Ron said, no, I've got to go home and look at the scriptures and make sure this is possible. I said, I don't know about this. So he went home and searched all the scriptures. He found out the ark never left Jerusalem. At least it's never told that it left Jerusalem, and it didn't come back. All of a sudden, it just kind of quietly disappeared during the days of Jeremiah. The ark is mentioned up until that point, but it's just gone from, from uh, the scriptures. Never mentioned again. Now, let's look at Second Chronicles chapter 26. <clears throat> King Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host shields and spears and helmets and harbor guns and bows and slings to cast stones. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones. So Uzziah made catapults, going to fling big stones. These things are on the walls in Jerusalem. Here the Bible tells us that King Uzziah made these. Well, a couple of hundred years later, Nebuchadnezzar comes to take over Jerusalem. He doesn't want his guys walking up to the wall because these guys got these huge machines on top that fling stones. Catapults. There's a catapult right there. There's a couple of different types of catapult. One is the arm comes down and the rock or whatever you're going to fling sits on the arm. <clears throat> and you have any number of ways to s flip it up. You can just put a giant weight on the other end like a teeter-totter. You have a giant weight on one end and a small weight on the other end. We have to pull it down, and then when you release it, the weight just flings it out. You can get even more distance by having a cable or a rope on there, so it gives the snap the whip effect. There's a contest, I think it was in Junkyard Wars, they had, who could throw the, the car the farthest? They threw a whole car. <laughs> they made these machines, you know, that are flinging this car, you know, 120 yards. And why? <laughs> who cares? Anyway. Uh, Uzziah made these catapults to fling big stones. So they would, of course, have some kind of maximum range. I mean, you couldn't fling them forever. So apparently, Nebuchadnezzar built a wall outside the range of these catapults. Object is to starve the people out. A siege. It's, you know, you go, you camp around, nobody comes in, nobody goes out. Eventually, they run out of food. And so they built a wall outside the city wall. Jerusalem already had a city wall. They back up a few hundred yards or whatever their maximum range was, build another wall. Nebuchadnezzar did. Inside these two is called no man's land. Catapults can't fling the rocks quite far enough to hit the new wall, and nobody can get through to bring you any more food, so it's just a matter of time till you're starving. After you've eaten all the food, then you eat all the horses and all the cows, and then the rats, and then the, you know, then you surrender. Maybe. So, Ron said he figures that Jeremiah knew they were going to lose. The king was not listening to God's word. God said, surrender. They wouldn't surrender. Nebuchadnezzar is going to take over. Jeremiah said, well, I better hide the ark and some of the temple furniture. So he thinks um, Jeremiah took the ark of the covenant, the table of showbread, some of the important temple furniture, took it out at night in between these two walls, outside the city wall, but inside the siege wall, and took it into one of a, a cave area. And there's caves all over there. It's like honeycomb, this area, that, you know, little tunnels and big tunnels, and you crawl around and get lost, and they never find you. He took it back in one of these and then built a false wall in front of it. And Jeremiah and everybody else went off into captivity. And apparently he died there and didn't get a chance to tell anybody where it was. Or, for whatever reason, people lost track of where it was. And for 2,600 years, nobody knew where the Ark of the Covenant was. Ron is, spends the next eight years, I believe he said, digging through this garbage dump, moving mountains of rubble, been accumulating for hundreds of years. He said as they're digging, uh, there's, a, there's a, a wall and then a flat place where the road was and a bunch of junk piled up against it. So they're digging and moving all this junk for, he said, he went over there as much time as he could spare for, um, I think he said eight years. Okay. He and his sons, and he would hire a neighbor, you know, people over there, you know, pay them to come work moving all this junk. As they moved the pile down lower and lower, they came to uh, three squares cut into the rock, into the side of this cliff. Obviously chiseled in by somebody, a couple inches deep, just recessed. 
He thought, oh, that is strange. What is this? Three, three of them. Kept digging down farther and farther through the junk. And they came to a little ledge sticking out, solid rock, with a square hole in it. And there was kind of a, uh, a truncated pyramid shape stuck in the hole. So he pulls this rock out, and there's a square hole about two and a half feet deep. Somebody's chiseled this into the rock. He said, yeah, Brother Hovind, here's the plug I took out. He goes over, and he's using it for a doorstop in his house up in Nashville. He said, this is the plug I took out. Apparently, this hole was to put a cross in to crucify somebody. And they would keep, when they're not using it, they stick the, they stick the plug in the hole to keep dirt out of the hole. Right above this were the three things set into the rock. He said, I think that's where they put the signs in three languages, what the guy's being crucified for, what his crime was. He said, we kept moving more junk out of the way, and we found three more holes down a little lower. So they had a ledge where the important criminal was crucified, and then three more, you know, one on each side and one straight in front. He said, apparently they were set up, they could crucify a max of four at a time. He said, while we're digging through this, we also found, a he said, it was really strange, we found a all of a sudden we hit a layer of a whole bunch of rocks about the size of hard balls, baseballs. Hundreds and hundreds of these rocks. And then we began finding all sorts of fragments of finger bones. Bones of people's fingers. Little slivers. He said, I work at the hospital. You know, he's a nurse anesthesiologist. He said, I began, I recognized him right away. I said, these are finger bones. What are they doing here? And he said, man, I bet this is where they stoned people to death. Everybody's throwing rocks at you. What are you going to do? Put your hands up to cover your face. It's going to smack your fingers right off. So he said he's digging along, and he notices from this one hole up, up on the ledge, the one by itself, there's a crack in the solid rock. He said it's this huge solid rock slab, and there's a crack right in the middle. So I thought that was kind of strange, about a half inch wide, just a little, you know, a little crack, but you know, a real long crack, running straight off from the foot of this square hole. He said, we didn't think anything of it. We're over there digging and digging and, you know, spending weeks and months and after several years of digging over there. They find this cave system which goes everywhere. Here's a picture of Ron going into some of the caves. He said, many of these holes you have to breathe out in order to squeeze through. I mean, it's that tight. He said, we're digging and exposing these things all over the place and we find this little cave and we squeeze in and find out there's nothing there. So you <sighs> go back out and find, you know. He said, we're exploring all these caves. He said, all of a sudden, one of my Arab friends came out through one of these little holes, and he said, I quit, and took off. He didn't even give me, give me a chance to explain why. He just said, I quit. <laughs> it's sort of like the cave crawler, only all rock, nobody to, no way to rescue you, okay? <laughs> that cave crawler we did up at the Sequoia Cave, or uh, Cave hmm? in Alabama, Childersburg, Alabama. Oh, anyway. Um, the Soto Caverns, thank you. Okay. So Ron squeezes into this area, and it op he squeezes through and opens up into a bigger room. And he said he's looking around in here with his flashlight, and he sees a little gold glint, you know, flash back at him. So he goes over and he, you know, dusts this thing off, and there's the table of showbread. He thinks it's the table of showbread. You know, a little table, a little smaller than this, all gold. And he said, and he looked back in this one end area, and he could see this on the far right side, the upper picture, is what he, is the picture that he drew. He said, it looked like a, a box made out of solid rock. Somebody had taken this big rock and hollowed out the middle, chiseled out the middle, and put a, a solid rock lid on top of it. He said, but it was real close to the ceiling, and he said, I couldn't get my head over the top to see what's in the box. But the lid had been cracked, and part of it was moved away. And right above the crack in the lid was a crack in the ceiling. And he said, we finally did a bunch of measurements and figured out that crack in the ceiling goes straight up to the crack that we found earlier, up above from this, where the cross was. He says, I think Jesus, when he died on the cross, the Bible says the rocks rent, and his blood ran right down through that crack, right onto the Ark of the Covenant, which was inside right below him, in 15 or 20 feet of rock. I mean, that sure preaches good. Okay, I don't know if it's true or not, right? But that's the story Ron told me. And some people really blast Ron Wyatt for all sorts of things. Well, he never, you know, they'll say, 
Some of his finds were never documented. Well, that may be true, but that doesn't prove they're wrong. Not documented is not the same as proven wrong. <laughs> a vast difference, all right? And he gets blasted all the time by these guys who, you know, one guy said, how can one, how can one man find so many things? I said, well, how much time do you spend over there? He said, none. I said, okay, well, then he's probably likely to find more than you. <laughs> you don't need to be a genius to figure that out. Um, but according to Ron, Jesus, when he was crucified uh, on the cross, and it's not even, you know, Golgotha that they show you when they go on the tours of Israel over there. They have you this place up on top of a hill. He said, that's not it. He said, it's right here. It's garbage dump. So Ron says he found the place, the real place where Jesus was crucified, crucified and the real Ark of the Covenant. He said he finally did get to where he could move the concrete lid out of the way and look inside. And he said he thought about it long and hard before he touched it. You remember the last guy that touched it, you know, Uzzah. <laughs> God struck him dead. But then he said, I'm a blood-bought, born-again Christian. Uzzah was only, his sins were covered, mine are cleansed. He opened it up inside with the Ten Commandments. The bowl of manna wasn't there, and Aaron's walking stick wasn't there. Why? I don't know. They're never mentioned. Again, after the one time they mentioned that they were in there, apparently they rotted eventually and they threw them away. But um, that's his story. He says he didn't move it. He just went and told the Hebrew high priests or whoever, you know, the authorities, hey, I found the ark. Come with me. He showed it to them. They didn't touch it either. They still haven't touched it. It's still there. Nobody's moved it. He said he wouldn't make a big deal out of it because he didn't want to start World War III. He said, if you go around, hey, we got the Ark of the Covenant, if the average Jew finds this out, they're going to go tear down the Mosque of Omar because they want to build their temple real bad. You remember the guy that came here and played the harp on our back porch? He stopped in. He said, Brother Hovind, I saw your tapes. I love your ministry. Uh, and we get a lot of people stop in, you know, to visit us. And I said, well, what do you do? He said, well, I play the harp. He's a professional harpist, and he gave us a couple of CDs that he's made. It's just incredible harp music, you know. And he brought his harp on the back porch and set it up on the gazebo, and had we had all of our staff come in there while he played the harp for us. Gorgeous music. I said, Brother, uh, what do you know about the harps in Israel? He said, well, I'm helping them make the harps for the temple worship in Israel. Because, you know, in the Bible, they had so many people that had harps, you know, they played in the, in the temple. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I've been over there many times to Israel helping them make the harps to get ready for the, when they rebuild the temple. He said, they've got, I don't know, 30 or 40 or 50 of them made now, these harps, these little special harps they built. I said, well, have you talked to the high priests uh, about the Ark of the Covenant? He said, yeah, it's really strange. He said, they've been over there working like mad, getting ready to build their temple. They've got the harps ready. They've got the high priest garment ready. They've got, you know, the ashes of the red heifer, and he's naming all these things. He said, but when I mentioned to them, hey, what are you going to do about the Ark of the Covenant? They just smile and say, well, that's taken care of. He said, they won't talk about it. But Ron said, you know, with a, with a, a jackhammer and 30 minutes, you could knock a big hole in the wall over there and get that Ark, just walk out with it. So apparently they're waiting until the temple's built. At the right time, they're going to go in there, take it out, and present it to the world. And the temple has to be built in the place where the... Uh well, there's an interesting theory about that. Does the temple have to be built on that mountain? There is room to build the temple right next to the Mosque of Omar. And there have been a few attempts with radical Jews who've gone in there to try to lay the cornerstone. And they just about start a big war over there, okay? The Muslims are not happy about this. But some people think that this, this mountain goes up where the Mosque of Omar is, the Muslim mosque, and the Jews want to build theirs next door. Then there's a valley... And it continues with another mountain. One guy told me just a few months ago, he said, you know, Brother Hovind, I think that valley was cut in later. And because since it kind of continues on up, he said, really, they, they need to be across the valley building and it's wide open. I mean, I don't know. We'll find out someday. Anyway, Ron says the Ark of the Covenant is still there. It has two angels looking down at the mercy seat. Wings are touching, just like the Bible says. And the blood ran onto the mercy he thinks the blood of Christ ran right down onto the mercy seat. Now, I don't know, I can't verify any of this. But he said he took some of the, there was black stuff all over the ceiling and black stuff all over the mercy seat. Dried blood. <coughs> he took it back to the hospital where he works, or got somebody to analyze the dried blood, according to him. And they said, wow, this is human blood. It's pretty old. 
And it's kind of strange. It only has 23 chromosomes. That's what he said. He's never been able to document any of that. So people really blast him for even saying that. But I, I don't believe it or disbelieve it. Okay, I'm, I'm waiting for confirmation. Again, where is that exactly? This is on the north side of Jerusalem. Now I'm going uh, this next spring. If you want to go with on the tour, I'm going to lead a tour group on a place I've never been. Uh, <laughs> but I'm gonna, if it's a 10-day cruise, we're going to stop in Greece, uh, 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 Turkey, see some of the cities of Ephesus, where John, Isle of Patmos, where John wrote Revelation. We're going to go see Egypt, climb around in the pyramids, go see the Sphinx, and go to Israel. So I'm getting all kinds of stuff together that we want to be sure to go look at, okay? If I can get some other folks to go with that have been there a bunch of times. Who can, I'd like to get Richard Reeves, who's been over there a bunch of times, with Ron, you know, or somebody like that to go with us, and he can take us right and see Sodom and Gomorrah, some of the things that wouldn't be on your normal, normal tour. That's an expensive trip, but that's uh, going to be some li trip of a lifetime to see all that stuff. Okay. <clears throat> I was... Uh, as I touched the ark and God killed him. So that's why the Jewish authorities have decided we're not going to touch this until we're real sure we got everything ready. Okay, Not going to mess around with God anymore. So if you don't believe me, look at wyattmuseum.com. Talk to Richard Reeves uh, or talk to Nell Wyatt, Ron's wife. She can say, look, I knew him. I was married to him for years and years. He was a good godly man. And I, I believed him. She never saw it either. Okay. A couple more thoughts here. The Hebrew letter Shin is the symbol for God. The Shin is the sort of like, looks like a W. Roughly, I don't know if you can see it on that picture right there. That's the Hebrew letter. Hebrews, I don't know any Hebrew, but uh, I've been told that it's, uh, each letter has a numeric value and also sometimes has me one letter can mean a whole name. Okay? And it, most Jews, if you find outside, outside their house on the door, or on the side of the door, they'll have a, a Shin, the symbol for God. The three letter. Numbers chapter 6, the Bible says, They shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Put my name upon the children of Israel. In 1 Kings 9, uh, the Lord said, This will be a hallowed house which thou hast built to put my name there forever. So God said, I'm going to put my name in Jerusalem forever. In 2 Kings, in Jerusalem will I put my name. 2 Kings chapter 21, in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. In Jerusalem, 2 Chronicles 33, will I put my name forever. A shin, if you look up Psalms 119, Psalm 119 is a, the longest chapter in the Bible, 176 verses. Every uh, 11 verses go together. <coughs> is that right? 11 or 9? It has the, the number break. Somebody look up your Bible there. Does it go 9 verses to a... It's got all the different... It's got... There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So there are 22 divisions to Psalm 119. The first group of verses all started with the Hebrew letter A. The second group of verses all started with B. The third all started with C. So if you're a Hebrew kid in fourth grade trying to learn to memorize Psalm 119, it'd be very easy. Much easier than it would be for us to memorize the entire chapter. Because all these verses start with the same thing. The book of Lamentations is that way also. There are five chapters in Lamentations. Chapter 1 has 22 verses. Each verse starts with, you know, first verse starts with an A, second verse with a B, third verse with a C. So you can memorize the whole chapter easily. And each verse in chapter 1 has three sentences. All of those sentences in verse 1 start with A. All three verses, all three sentences in, in verse 2 start with a B. Chapter 2 is the same way. When you come to chapter 3, it has... Um, 66 verses instead of 22. Still divisible by 22, though. So now verse 1, 2, and 3 all start with A, and then verse 3, 4, 5 all start with B, etc. in Hebrew. Of course, it doesn't translate to English. Well, there's a lot of things like that in the scriptures that, you know, that we, we don't catch. You notice the Shin, S-C-H-I-N, here in Psalm 119, 161. There's the little weird-looking W again, the Hebrew letter Shin. God said he would put his name in Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem happens to have three valleys. The city itself is a big shin. Put my name there forever. 
that'll preach. There's a sermon in there somewhere. Somebody find it. Okay. Another next question. What about Bigfoot? Oh, my brother has two of them. I have interviewed eight people who've seen one. Todd Jurassic in uh, Oklahoma told me he saw one. There's his phone number. Long story short, I was at uh, a guy told me that that video footage was fake. He works with the guy that wore the costume for that. The last church you were at was in what state? Uh, Washington. Washington. Was I go to. When I was in Washington or when I was in. Uh, mm -hmm. I was either Washington or. Uh, I go to Idaho this week, right next door. Uh, so you're saying the guy at the church you were at said he works with the guy who wore that costume to make the... They're, they're getting ready to talk about, they're getting ready to publish some book about it. And about the Patterson film. Yeah, he's yeah. not supposed to show the costume to anybody or something like that. He still has the costume. Ah, could be. I don't know if it's fake or not. The Patterson film is the best and most famous film of all, uh, showing this ape-like creature walking away from the creek. According to the story, Patterson and his buddy were up riding horses looking for Bigfoot. He's a Bigfoot researcher, okay? And so when somebody's out looking for Bigfoot and then finds it and gets a good picture, you've got to say, uh, let's really double-check this, okay? So I can't verify the film or not. All I know is I've had eight Christians tell me at different locations all over the country, Mr. Hovind, I saw one. I, this is not, not the Patterson one, okay? You've had three. Um, Bill Gibbons from Canada, who wrote the book with me, Claws, Jaws, and Dinosaurs, he is doing a lot of research in Oklahoma where there are many folks who claim they've seen Bigfoot in this one region right near the Oklahoma-Arkansas border. There are many sightings in the woods there. One guy apparently shot one here uh, two years ago with a 30 out 6 at 10 o'clock at night, and the others came and dragged it off. I mean, you can study Bigfoot for the rest of your life, and there's a lot of people who devote their whole life to it, you know. Uh, if you watched Harry and the Hendersons. Uh, the guys who I've talked to tell me it's like Harry and the Hendersons. It's seven feet tall, eight feet tall, uh, stinks, long hair, can run incredibly fast. I was preaching in Port St. Joe, Florida. I think you preached in Port St. Joe, didn't you, at that church? One of the kids there in the high school was a senior in high school. He came to me after the seminar and he said, Brother Hovind, what do you think about Bigfoot? I said, man, I don't know. I don't laugh at people who claim they've seen it because I don't know. He said, well, well, well good. Let me tell you a story then. Because he was waiting to see what I would say before he continued. He said, I saw one. He said, about six months ago, I heard a noise outside my trailer at a mobile home. He said, it's like 10 o'clock at night. And uh, I stepped out the door and looked over and there was this thing stood up. He said, it was almost even with the top of my trailer, which would have been just but nearly nine feet tall. He said the eyes were red. Many people say that the eyes are red. Okay, maybe it's just like you shine a light in somebody's eyes that reflects the lead ba red back. Where human eyes don't do that. There's a substance that uh, animals have in their eye that you don't. That their eyes reflect back red. He said the eyes were red. He said it looked at me and then it turned and took off running. He said it. He said I've never. I couldn't believe anything could run that fast. He said, but it probably went nearly 20 feet with each step. Once it got moving, you know. He said and gone into the woods. He said, that's what I saw. He said, it looked like Harry and the Hendersons, only bigger. I had a guy at a church up in uh, International Falls, Minnesota. Assistant pastor at the church, I believe. Told me, Brother Hovind, I saw one. Nearly ran into it with my car. So, I don't know. Here's a picture. Um, you can barely see the eyes glowing in the dark there. This is from South Florida. Somebody claims they got a good picture of one in South Florida. They've been seen in just about all 50 states. Probably, there's no question, many of them are hoaxes or frauds or somebody dressing up in a costume. Okay? Probably a lot of them would fit that category. Some may be simply misidentified. Somebody saw a grizzly bear and got excited and said, oh, wow, or a black bear. Oh, I saw a Bigfoot. But there are too many that cannot be explained away like that. So I'm going to have to leave that one on hold. I do not know what it is. If you find out, let me know. If you catch one, I'll put it in our museum right here. And I will stuff it first. Um, who were the Nephilim of Genesis chapter 6? Well, Genesis chapter 6. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. So the question is, who are these sons of God? 
There are several theories about this. Some people think the sons of God were the godly line of uh, this. They said this is where the the line of Seth began. To, or, uh, yeah, Seth began to marry the line of Cain. You know, Cain killed Abel, and then God, you know, kicked him out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they'll say, see, Cain's children are now marrying Seth's children. Well, that doesn't make any sense. For one thing, it wouldn't produce anything unusual when an un, when a unsaved person marries a saved person. And I don't think you could prove from Scripture that all Cain's children are saved, and all, or Seth's are saved, and Cain's are not. Because all of them drowned in the flood, except for one family, Noah. Okay? <laughs> a, lot of, uh, Shem, or a lot of Seth's children died in that flood, too. Even Noah probably had brothers that died in the flood. Because Noah's father, Lamech, it says he lived so many years and had Noah. And then it says he lived 500 more years and had sons and daughters. So Noah's own brothers and sisters weren't listening to him. So I don't think I don't buy into the theory that these sons of God are the line of Seth and the evil people are the line of Cain. I don't buy that at all. Henry Morris has a great footnote on this, the best I've seen in his Defender's Bible. In the Defender's Bible, the Henry Morris footnote, he says this is definitely fallen angels, and he lists you know ten more verses where the sons of God is an obvious reference to angels. Um, his theory is that the f angels, from, some of the angels from heaven, when Satan rebelled, decided to follow Lucifer. They thought they could win. And the only reference I know about this is in, in Revelation, where it says a third of the angels followed Satan. And here that's in the book of Revelation. So a lot of people are going around preaching that a third of the angels followed Satan at the beginning, when he fell. Could be true, but I have not found a verse to document that yet. If that's true, a third of the angels, the most commonly accepted theory that I've seen among uh, Christians is that a third of the angels followed Lucifer when he rebelled. Some of those, some of that one third, married the daughters of men before the flood, ended up having producing a race of half human, half demon, and those children all drowned in the flood. They're called the Nephilim. And after the flood, of course, Noah's sons are going to tell the stories of things they saw before the flood to their kids. Oh, yeah, you should have seen the guy that lived down the street from us. You know, he was whatever. And that, that led to the legends of Zeus and Thor and, you know, the Greek gods. That all the, the, goddess, the gods and goddesses' legends are probably from pre-flood people that they really saw. That's, I couldn't prove any of that. That just seems to be the most reasonable explanation for what's going on here. Uh, Chuck Missler has a great book called The Return of the Nephilim. He says it's going to happen again. One very reasonable theory is that the angels that did this, God chained them in darkness. They're already in hell. The ones that did not get involved in this are the demons today. So the fallen angels would fall into two categories, those that are already in hell and those that are not there yet. So that would make sense if, you know, the when the, Jesus saw the maniac of Gadara, a guy full of demons, and he said, Come out of him, you demons. And the demons said, Oh, are you here to torment us before our time? Like they already know, they already know they're going to be tormented. They already know they're going to hell. They said, Are you here to torment us before our time? And they said, Would you let us go into the pigs? Now, why Jews are out raising pigs, I don't know. <laughs> Think about that one, right? Right. So uh, Jesus said, go ahead. So all these demons go into the pigs. The pigs run into the water. The water goes into the pigs, and they all drown. But that's the best I've heard, is that probably these is fallen angels. Now, angels in Scripture, when they manifest themselves to people, always take on the body of a man. So that's the best I've heard. But the Nephilim are probably the fallen angels, but I don't know. I wouldn't be dogmatic on preaching that, but that's how I do it. And Eric, you get to ask all, oh, you know how it is when you're out speaking. You get a whole variety of questions asked to you. You know, I try to have an answer or, or the best I know on some of these commonly asked questions. So here we have Genesis chapter 2 telling us that these sons of God took the daughters of men, and they became, uh, which were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, 
My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Some people have taken this verse to say, see, God said nobody will live past 120, and we've had people in China live to be 140, documented. So the Bible can't be true. <laughs> Does that verse say nobody will live past 120? No. And if you start with a false beginning, you're going to get a false ending. One argument here is that this verse means God said this to Noah 120 years before the flood came. So it has nothing to do with the longevity of mankind. You've got 120 years till the flood comes. I don't know, but that's one very reasonable interpretation of this verse. And the Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days. And some people conclude that the verse 2, the sons of God marrying the daughters of men, goes with verse 4. I don't think you can prove that. Sons of God saw the daughters of men, and that's all it says. This might be totally unrelated. The giants may not even be the offspring of this. I don't think, I mean, read the chapter yourself and see if you can put it together. I think in a court of law, you'd have an awful hard time proving that verse 4 goes with verse 2. Well, and then right after, though, it goes back to talking about the sons of God. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare them children, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Is that talking about the giants? Well, is that talking after the flood, too? No, this is before the flood still. Flood starts a few verses later. This is Genesis 6. So I think you'd have a hard time proving that the giants are the result of this marriage of the sons of God and the daughters of men. So there have been many, many sermons preached on this that I think somebody may have to retract a few things when they get to heaven and say, oops, I'm sorry, I didn't know. So read it carefully. It could be, but it's not necessarily proven that one relates to the other. Verse 5, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and the imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord sent the flood, destroyed everybody. So I don't know who the Nephilim were. Best theory is it's probably half demon, half man. We'll have to leave it at that. Okay? Last class next week, we'll talk about a whole bunch of other questions like, uh, what about Bible codes? Is there something to that? What about UFOs? How long were they in the garden? Where is the Garden of Eden? What about the Mark of the Beast? What about the Shroud of Turin? And we'll cover all that next week.